Welcome to WLIWFM In Conversation, our special program that brings you dynamic voices from across our region and beyond. I'm Brian Cosgrove from WLIWFM, and it is my pleasure to be joined by Deborah Lee Furness. Now, uh, Deborah Lee is an actor, director, human rights advocate for vulnerable children, and founder of Hope Land and Adopt Change, along with Nick Evans, who is CEO and co founder of Hope Land. Welcome to In Conversation. Thanks, Brian. It's, it's a great to be here. It's a pleasure, a pleasure to talk to you both. Now, this question is for the both of you and Deborah Lee, if we could start with you. What's a, uh, a general uh, overview of what uh, Hope Land does and hopes to do? And also, why did you start it? Okay, let's start with why. I always like to start with the why. Okay. Um, uh, Hopeland grew out of, I was in Australia. I have two adopted children and I tried to adopt in Australia. It was very hard. And I found there was an anti-adoption culture there. So I, I had traveled the world. I had seen how many vulnerable children there were. And I knew how many loving families could provide that security for these kids. So I started speaking out. And we, you know, we have an anti-adoption culture. So the last 10 years we've been advocating, we've shifted the culture there. Children are spending less time in foster care. But then I went to uh, why are there so many children that are left in this vulnerable position, which is where Hopeland came. It's like the why is why. And the big majority of the reason why there are so many vulnerable children is poverty. I mean, there's mental health, there's war, there's disease, there's many reasons, but poverty is a big, big reason why. So Hopeland was, okay, let's go to the other end. Instead of fixing the problem when it's already broken, let's try and get some strength and, and get a support in place so that families don't have to relinquish. And that's where Nicholas comes in. Nicholas was working in England at the time and he was working at, at the other end as well. He was collecting kids who had gone through drug addiction, um, that's right. Yeah. For me, my journey was a little bit different. I'd started working, as, as Deb said, with children who had drug and alcohol addictions. I was working in prisons, police stations, and I kept seeing this common denominator that children who lacked safe, loving families often ended up in those kind of situations. Sadly, the trajectory of those children's lives were almost set out, almost from, from point dot, which was just horrifying to me. And I just thought, what could be done to try and go sort of upstream and address that issue so we don't have to have children in this position further downstream that I was spending, you know, about 20 years dealing with. So that really is what sort of created that drive to bring change for vulnerable children. And as you said before, Brian, when we were speaking before we started recording, was it all starts in childhood. Hmm. And and any child, like this is what I found with adoption uh, or or abandonment, any child that is separated from from their birth family That is a trauma. Now, we all suffer traumas. We can suffer trauma when our maths teacher failed us. You know, there's different degrees of that. But that initial uh, uh, trauma has a huge impact, which is why it is so necessary that we have to be expedient and come in with care. As soon as a child is abandoned, we need to make this work fast. And this is what the adoption was about. Like, if adoption is the best option, then after we've gone through... reunification of family or kinship care, if that's the set, we have to have a gold standard in adoption whereby it works efficiently, that the people in the departments are are trained in this area of dealing with, you know, traumatised children. So we've tried to really cover all bases. Um, and, And so we've gone to the other end addressing the poverty as one aspect of. Gotcha. And I want to urge folks to go to uh, their website, which is our hopeland.org. Now, is there a home base for Hopeland? It's obviously, it's a global problem. It's a human problem. I would imagine you focus wherever you can focus, wherever you find out there's a problem, but is it domestic? Are you based in uh, New York and do you work globally? I know you work with the United Nations. It takes a village. So, you know, this is a global problem and the way the Hope Lands that we work in partnership with, with we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We, so we, we have many relationships that people are already on the ground doing work and we empower them. Like Nick went recently and spoke at the uh, European Parliament. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah, I spent some time at the European Parliament in Brussels, which was a wonderful experience. We have to talk about best practice and how we can bring reform for vulnerable children. So that's the kind of work we're doing, whether it's myself speaking in Brussels, whether it's Deb speaking at the UN here in New York, 
really trying to bring about the biggest amount of change for the most amount of young people in the best possible way. And it's, it's interesting. Like I, I listened to a, a podcast last night with this woman. Like we always imagine this huge poverty problem and, and having to relinquish children as in Africa or in Asia. That's what we see. And there was a woman last night from Yonkers. She's a, a, a single mom of five children. At 16, she had a baby and had to leave school. So she has no education. And she ends up in this position. Her second marriage fell. She has five children to look after. Oh, she lives in Yonkers. She got to the state of, because she she just kept hearing no. There was no employment. There was, people kept knocking her back. She could not get a job. So she got to the stage where she didn't want to put her children in the system. What, imagine that decision for a mother, because people always think when mothers relinquish their children, they're bad people. They're not. It, everyone wants to do their best. But she was in a position her children were going to starve. She, was at the, she went to pick up her kids from school, and the only choice she had was to ask the teacher to please care for her children while she got on her feet. Anyway, there's this amazing uh, bakery up in Yonkers. I'm going to give them a plug called Greystone, and it's being started. So it's people coming out of prisons. It's, it's basically no questions asked, and they give them employment. And the, this, it literally getting this job changed this woman's life. She kept her family together. And that's what Hopeland's ab about, is providing the support so you're not put in that situation of having to relinquish your child. I can't imagine making that choice. Uh, yeah. And so many times at these orphanages, you know, they're, they're sold a bill of goods. There's corruption that, you know, give us your child, we'll feed them, we'll educate, look after them. Children do not thrive in orphanages. And I think this is what people don't understand is, oh, they get food and they're looked after. No, their spirit dies. They are a number. I've seen a 15-year-old boy in an orphanage in Cambodia that looked like he was seven. He didn't oh thrive physically, mentally, or emotionally. They're very damaging. So we as the grown-ups have to come up with solutions that negates the orphanage, that we step over that. If you're just joining us, uh, I'm Brian Cosgrove. This is In Conversation, and it's my pleasure to be talking to Deborah Lee Furness and Nick Evans, co-founders of Hopeland. And you mentioned this idea of uh, the poverty is uh, a main reason, but the statistics on your website, and I urge folks, please go to the website. Uh, it's just an education in general, whether you're able to do something or not, ourhopeland.org, that it is eight times less expensive to raise a child in a family setting than it is to send in an orphanage, right? I know, a phenomenal statistic when you think about it. And yeah. What it means is that if you imagine a family has often a structure, they might be struggling financially, they might be trying to hold down multiple jobs, but it, that bit of food that that family has can extend that little bit further. Whereas if you create an entirely new structure, which is what we do when we build orphanages, what you effectively do is you have to try and finance that entire engine and it becomes actually what is phenomenal is it actually becomes something that sucks children out of families. Because if you've got a poor yeah. mum or dad up the street who's struggling to support their child, they could they, they may think that the most obvious solution is to put that child into an orphanage. But it's actually not. As we show on our website, it's eight to nine times cheaper having a child in a family than an orphanage. So if we can try and champion family-based care, we can have a major impact. And the other thing, the other statistic that I want to throw out there that you might have noticed, Brian, on the website is the fact that 80 to 90% of children who are in orphanages actually have a living parent. Yeah. And if you stop and think about that, that's a phenomenal statistic. That's not just in certain African countries or Asian countries. That's the entire planet. When mm. they started doing global research, they realized that we're filling orphanages with children which have parents where we could be supporting those families in such a cheaper way, kind of dealing with all the issues Deb just mentioned about the attachment harm that we cause to children when we rip children out of families. So, you know, that's really what we want to do, go right upstream, try and deal with those issues, which is why, you know, Deb had a major role at the UN in 2019, really championing major reform around focusing on family-based care. And we were really excited that the UN committed, all the member states of the UN committed to focus on family-based care with a resolution in the Convention on the Rights of the Child in 2019. So we want to see more of that work and also make sure that that's not just a pledge by countries, but it follows through. There's real tangible impact on the ground, and that's what we're working with different countries on right now. So it's exciting to see countries step up and take this seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a staggering statistic that you said, uh, Nick, that uh, the fact that uh, 80 to 90 percent of kids in orphanage, orphanages uh, do have uh, at least one living parent. And, a, and, to, uh, and Deborah Lee, back to what you said, this is not 
to cast judgment. You don't know what it's like for that woman who, who had her first child at 16 and who, had, who now has five. You can't judge. You cannot no, judge, it's right? It's choice. Can you imagine where these no. women always judge? They relinquish their child. Usually, it's to think they're thinking they're doing the best thing they That's can for right. their child. And I can't imagine not being if my child is crying and is hungry, and I didn't have the food. To, I, I can't imagine what that feels like. Yeah, and the fact that you guys, uh, the solutions that you are looking at, as you mentioned earlier, you're trying to get at the heart of the problem before it happens. You want to exhaust all the possibilities before someone has to make that devastating decision of placing their child in foster care or in an orphanage. And you guys are really doing a tremendous job. Oftentimes, and again, this is uh, some information that I found on the website, grandparents might take children. One Kinship of the, care, right. we, exactly. So, and, and then therefore provide support for the grandparents so that they can facilitate that. Exactly. I mean, imagine being someone... Uh, in later years of your life, you've, now you've got some, some toddlers or younger kids, and you just need a, a, like an, a couple of hours occasionally. Folks can come in uh, through Hopeland, reach out to you guys, and that's a, nut, that's a way for them to maybe put a little ease on grandparents that are looking over kids, right? Mm -hmm. It's so true, and I, I think one, one thing which I often think about, how would I deal with, with this situation if I was faced with this personally. You know, I would want my children to end up with someone who I knew loved them and cared for them. Yeah. And if I could, if that support could be provided to them so that the child didn't have to end up in foster care, didn't have to end up in an orphanage, then you just start to realize how key that family network is and how empowering them is so crucial to stop some of the tragic situations that I had to deal with for many years in England when I was working with kids who at young ages were affected by substance misuse or in the criminal justice system, many times because they just, the pain of, of their situation, the abandonment is just so horrible that they try and self-medicate, they try and find any way to cope with it. So if we can provide that wraparound support, it's just so crucial. And that's another thing. We've part, we're partnering up with uh, the Texas, TCU, Texas Christian University, that, because I always say you can give food, you can give shelter, and you can find a home. The, as I say, these kids have been traumatized. And unless you deal, it's like all of us who have therapists, we all have our issues. Unless you can provide support to deal with that trauma, they cannot flourish. So we are working with the TCU to try and do an outreach of educators and facilitators to go to all these places where there is harm and support that transition. It's not just the practicality of food and shelter. That needs to be attended to because we know if people are hurting, they can't move on. So these are some of the subtleties. And, like, there's another organisation in, in, in L.A. These two girls have set up a sense of home whereby people donate their old furniture. So foster children who are graduating out, like this is a big transitional moment, they're no longer under the state care. But I know my 18-year-old wouldn't have a clue what to do as he leaves you know, high school, so they, they will furnish a house for these kids. You provide this sort of support, it, it means that you can ensure a greater degree of success that they can flourish. So Absolutely. these are the subtle little relationships and little ways that we can really put a, a duvet, a blanket around raising up this community. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And again, I just want to remind folks, I'm Brian Cosgrove. This is WLIW-FM's In Conversation. And what a pleasure it is to have Deborah Lee Furness and Nick Evans. They are co-founders of Hopeland. And basically, it's uh, an organization that tries to uh, have parents and families stay together, give them many, many options before they have to possibly uh, put a child into foster care or an orphanage. Um, and we're talking about some of the solutions. And the website is just tremendous, ourhopeland.org. And as you mentioned, to helping uh, a child who is um, aging out of foster care by maybe helping them find an apartment maybe giving them a little bit of a financial security, being in their corner, helping maybe get a job. Well, I'd love to see this inter introduced to all corporations. I mean, these yeah. kids, they're hungry to learn. They're hungry to, to, to do something productive and be a, a productive member of the community. I would love to see a program with all the corporations that there is. They take in, have interns in of a certain group of kids out of foster care. If we can be creative in our solutions and have, it takes a village, as I said, it's all of us being involved. Corporations can pay a part. You, you know, communities, individuals. That's why I say it's for everyone. You don't have to adopt a child to solve this problem. We can all play a part with our own creativity, what we can do to help. Right. And, and Hopeland, this is not a black and white thing. Hopeland is not 
uh, looking for families uh, to adopt. I, I just want to emphasize there's, there's many, many subtleties as uh, Deborah Lee and Nick are talking about here where you can help. It's not, you know, a black and white thing. It's not like, oh, geez, I, I don't have room for a child. That's that's not what we're talking about here. There's many, many subtleties to help out. Companies can help out uh, folks who might be um, with school supplies or help folks with education. Uh, people who are involved in the education system, corporations, maybe in sports who can help kids yep. maybe go out and, you know, get them some sporting equipment or get them part of a team. There's, there's I just love the way that you guys are really getting uh, deep into the many, many ways that you can help kids. And, um, you know, practical way too. like even we have a coffee shop. So we're hoping that we can, um, you know, provide a, maybe a barista school where these kids can go and learn right. a trade. And then I'm thinking, then I go, okay, so they learn the trade. Then we teach them business so they get their own truck because it's a very mobile world at the moment. Oh so they can have their own business. You know, it just takes creativity. And I know when I sit down with a group of friends, oh, what about this? What about that? And in, people can do this in communities and say, oh, we could do this. There's so many. It's a shopping list of solutions that we can all come up with. So there's there's many, many different ways. Uh, you guys, uh, you talk about it, you, you, you try things. And I love the idea that you guys monitor and measure and look, say, you know, you think it's always, you know, if this sounds good or looks good on paper, and then maybe the results aren't quite what we had hoped for or something that you really didn't think sounded good, yeah. You, get, you, you really gain traction with, and these kids start to benefit. So could you talk a little bit about the monitoring and the, the, the things that don't work and do work and that you found so far? I think one of the key things to understand about vulnerable children globally is that the data is really poor. And it's a horrible reality, but often if a young person has grown up in a poor community, um, they might not benefit from a birth certificate. You know, basic sort of... Um, things that allow us to exist um, often aren't even in place. So one of the big pro programs we're working on right now and we're leading up to an event in September is about how do we improve legal identity and champion legal identity for children. Because once you are existing, you know, obviously they're there, but they're not existing in terms of from the data point of view. And we had this when we did a campaign a number of years ago. Um, it was called All Children Count, but Not All Children Are Counted. Wow. And we recognize that one of the big issues was that if children aren't counted, they can't be helped through tools like the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And how do we make sure that's happened? So that's, that's just a really foundational base requirement we have to put in place for vulnerable children around the world. Beyond that, once we start to get an idea of those vulnerable children, we can put in place wonderful interventions to provide support. One of those interventions we're doing right now, we're setting up, is in Indonesia. And the reason why is Indonesia has got one of the highest rates of children in orphanages on the planet. Um, and this is something which more and more people have been speaking about and, and recognizing this issue, as we, we talked about earlier, Brian. So we're working currently to set up a development impact bond in Indonesia. A development impact bond is very exciting. Because what it does is it has an investor that provides a, a uh, sort of initial investment into the program, and then they have organizations that pay back if they're successful. So the benefit of it, it is, is it's like a payment by results model. You don't just provide sort of old fashioned charity work where you throw money at it, hope it succeeds, but it's only, you only get paid if it's successful. So it, what it does is it encourages new investment and new people who, um, you know, hopefully people who are listening today who think, yeah, I want to invest into this issue. How can I do that? Then come and talk to us. As you kindly provided the, um, the website details, get in touch with us as a way to click on to that and, and get in touch and find out how you can support the kind of work we're doing that is truly payment by results, that we make sure that's not just good old charity work where we hope for the best, but it's how do we bring innovation into this sector based on really core cool data. And we get the data, exactly. Yes. It's so yeah. hard to get the accountability. You can't knock on the front door of an orphan. I mean, there is no front door. So, you know, so there, this gives us the data and that's how we know that's all the politicians here. So once we have that data, we have a tool in which to force policy change or show if you do this, it's going to help your, your community, your country. Abs yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you're listening to WIW's In Conversation. I'm Brian Cosgrove, along with Deborah Lee Furness and Nick Evans. They are co-founders of Hopeland, a wonderful organization. And we urge you to go to their website, Our Hopeland. Dot org. Now, uh, Deborah Lee, I know that you've come out to the East End with your family for a, a long, long time. Have you done, has Hopeland done anything on the East End? And you think there's not a lot of need out there? There is both my kids, uh, 
actually volunteer was well, especially during the pandemic at the local uh, farm where there was a huge amount of need yes. for food. There was food shortage. So my kids were involved in that. They, you know, they were out there helping and, and, and in the in the garden and, and making sure there was food supplies. You always think in America or it, it, it's not a reality. But there right. is. So that's one little way of helping out there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. This is WLIW FM's In Conversation. Deborah Lee Furness and Nick Evans, uh, C, uh, they are co-founders of uh, Hopeland, a wonderful, wonderful organization. So the goal uh, here is to, I, I would imagine, to find families, and Nick, you alluded to this, um, and you, this is really the basis of everything, uh, to get to identify families at risk before they make these devastating decisions or think that's their last resort. Because the benefits, again, another wonderful thing about the website, the benefits of keeping a family together if you can. And again, uh, this is not a judgment issue, but there are many ways to keep a family together. Uh, starts with everything to, from a longer lifespan to healthier people in general, higher IQs, the possibility that they move on to higher education, less crime, less drug addiction. This is all part of your main message, which is families and to be part of and to love and to be in a place where you don't feel judged and accepted is everything these days. Absolutely. Yeah. It's everything, right? And you realize that you see in the world at the moment the huge uh, messaging around mental health. Yeah. And there's all these addictions and all these things come from trauma. Yeah. And it's mental health and, you know, not feeling belong. Low self-esteem is a killer. You yeah. know, and these kids have low self-esteem because they don't feel that they are of worth. And, and as Karen Purvis, who created the Trust-Based Relational Intervention out of Texas Christian University, she always used to say, these kids, you need to look in their eyes and let these kids know they are precious. Yeah. I love that word, precious, that we are all, we all have something to give, and these kids do not feel like that. So we want to ensure that by belonging and, and being loved and being seen and heard, that they are healthier human beings and will live a, a thriving life. Well, I don't mean to embarrass you two, but Deborah Lee and Nick, you guys are good, good people. Really <laughs> good, good people. Now, Nick, you've got an extensive background. You talked about this a little bit before, about uh, helping uh, folks get on the road to recovery from alcoholism and drug addiction. And that is, uh, I would imagine, a close second to poverty, why families get torn apart, especially these days when we're losing folks to fentanyl. You know, I mean, the power of these opioids, uh, you know, people just think they're going to, you know, check out or have a good time or whatever it is. Uh, but we're losing folks. And then this is probably a common um, situation where, unfortunately, we lose a parent and then the grandparents step in to take over. Yeah. Right. With opioid addiction or an opioid death. Right, Nick? It's a huge aspect. And, you know, I think you made the point before about the value of grandparents and how they can step up and but ideally how they don't need to. Um, you know, I, I heard the expression recently saying, although I'm, you know, although I'm retired, I don't want to be tired. Um, you know, and I think for a lot of grandparents, that's how they feel. They feel like they've had to step in and they and we want to try and relieve that and, and relieve that pressure. So we've been working over the last couple of years to provide how you, you can provide respite support for grandparents and other carers. Because, uh, you know, one of the things that's, that's phenomenal that I learned when I started looking at the situation here in the U.S. in more detail was that over, over 50 percent of um Foster families stop being foster parents in the first year because they just can't handle the pressure and the, and the strain that's thrown on them. Because often if you get a child that's, that's dropped on your front doorstep and they come from a traumatic background, as Deb alluded to before, you know, they're dealing with just so much pain and so much um, hurt that they often will bring that into that family environment, not intentionally, mm -hmm. but right. because that's just what they've learned to and how they've learned to cope. And so if we can provide support around those foster families, it's crucial. Uh, you know, rather than, you know, I get frustrated sometimes when I hear that narrative of saying foster care is broken. It doesn't have to be. Um, yes, there's huge challenges, without a doubt. Uh, but, you know, in, I've been encouraged even looking at what's happened in New York in terms of reducing the number of children in foster system um, through providing you know, increased uh, support around permanency um, in terms of helping children move towards adoptions. It's all possible with that support network. 
And often this is an area which has been often really underfunded and under-resourced. So if we can try and empower those uh, social workers, those families, those foster families, then we can really set them, them up for success and they can be the kind of transformational stories that, that thankfully I got to witness when I was a drug and alcohol treatment counsellor for many years and see how those young people can not just be a statistic. And that's what happened, like something like that, the breakdown of the Russian adoption. You can't just think by showing love that you get this child that's pretty much feral because of the trauma um, that they can just provide love and it'll be okay. That's why our support is for the carers as well. You have to know what you are dealing with. And it's like a wild animal who needs a lot of care. So if, and, and if that breaks down again, that's you to the child, that's a second abandonment. Yeah. So that is damaging. So we have to provide the education to people who are willing to take this on so that they're empowered and it can succeed. And at the moment, you talk about the opioids, that's the biggest um, number of children that are being put up for adoption or going into kinship care is because of the opioid problem. Yeah, and boy, that is really the heart of the situation. If you talk about yeah. getting somebody the right treatment for addiction, having a kid get the right um, emotional and uh, psychological support to deal with their feelings as they are in foster care or they're staying with the family, to get the right care. That's another, yeah. that's another thing that is yeah. so, so important. Yeah. yeah. The thing that I found encouraging, Brian, is that it's not just, you know, we see the kind of learnings here in New York, obviously, that we were talking about just, just now, but these kind of models actually can be applied all around the world. I was in Rwanda in Kigali and they had these little ceremonies, which might sound a bit silly to a Westerner, but they were so beautiful and profound. They had these cow giving ceremonies for women who'd stepped up and supported vulnerable kids in their community. Because in that community, you know, a, a, you know, a rabbit or a sheep is sort of considered a kind of lower status. You know, then you might move to a goat and then you move to a cow, which sounds silly to a Westerner. But mm -hmm. if you're in parts of Rwanda where I was, you see how celebrating and championing and honoring wonderful women particularly who've stepped up for vulnerable kids can have such great impact. And one of the things that I found really interesting when I was looking at the statistics there was that they're actually having the highest rate of children going into universities wow. than any other African country because of their huge focus on early childhood development. Right. They're championing that and they see the repercussions in years to come. It's not just short-sighted kind of policies, it's, it's long-sighted policies. It sees it has a vision for what the future can be by investing in children and it sees the impact and society benefits from. So it's just so important that we can take these learnings and apply them across the world, even here in New York, but certainly every place where our feet, where we stand really. And can I just say, Rwanda is the only country, yeah. I think, that has completely emptied their orphanages. Wow. That, and, but, and, and it is also that, as Nick was saying, it is the culture there that, that the, 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 the local community does absorb the children, that is their culture, to, like a village, is to take care. But they have completely emptied their orphanages. Yeah. You know, the, the misconceptions, and, and, and uh, going back a little bit, um, the misconceptions, we've come a long way with addiction and the stigmas to mental illness or helping uh, a child out, you know, try to get through and, and talk about how they're feeling. We've come a long way, society, I think, but we still have a long, long way to go. And boy, do I admire the fact that you guys are well aware of that. Um, before I let you go, there's a couple of there's a couple of things I think. Are there any uh, anything on the horizon that Hopeland is extremely excited about? I mean, that you're doing any events, anything like that, or I mean, what you do is tremendous to begin with. So I just wanted to. Is there anything in the future? Well, like all other non for profit organizations, it's been very hard for us to keep going. But I have to say, last year, a friend of mine stepped up, the the artist Sarah Z, and donated a magnificent piece of art that was donated at Christie's. And we are, uh, at, at the moment, looking for some art to be donated, which will be uh, auctioned at Christie's to, so that we can continue the work we do. So that will be happening later in the year. Um, you know, there's a, there's a Christie's that's going to open up at a, at a store right down the, the street from here, us. We just found oh, yeah. out. It just Yeah, they're going to, Christie's Auction House is going to open up uh, a store in Southampton. On the well, I'm yeah. just going to put it out to all those people out there. there. Please look for the Hopeland piece this year. <laughs> It'll be a fabulous artist, and you'll be contributing to great work being done. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so, uh, real quick, we're talking to uh, Deborah Lee Furness. This is WLIW's FM In Conversation, along with Nick Evans, co founders of uh, Hopeland. And if folks want to get involved, if they want to reach out to you, and there's many ways, I want to stress this, and I know you guys have been doing it 
uh, this wonderful conversation that we've had. There's many ways that you can help. This is, you can, there's small things, there's big things, there's in-between things, there's financial help. Would they, could they reach out to the website? How could they get a hold of uh, Hopeland and if they want to help? Well, we pride ourselves in innovation. So we welcome all creativity. If you've got a great idea of how you can help, if you can mentor a child in maths, there are, as I said, there's a plethora of, of things you could do. Uh, so if you have any ideas, if you can contribute in any way, please contact us through the website. That's it. That's it. Right, yeah. And I think one of the things that we do as well is that sometimes we'll be inviting people to come and work with Hopeline. Sometimes we help direct uh, people to where they can have a major impact. One thing that just comes to mind right now is um, CASA workers, court-appointed special advisors. One of the things that happens for vulnerable children is that if they have to attend court to make a decision about, you know, do they live with their, um, you know, with their mum or their dad, or do they live with neither, or what kind of situation? Often, young people are ending up in courts on their own. So, what we do is work in partnership with other great organisations to try and provide that wraparound support. And what we can also help do is direct people where they can have an impact and really try and support them on that journey. But the CASA worker, just so you know, the CASA worker is there for the child because the child has got mum and dad maybe pitted against each other. The CASA mm. worker is there in the best interest of a child. So it's their person that looks after them, just so you understand. Yeah. That. Gotcha. Partnership, really, partnership is so crucial to our work. Yeah. We try and build relationships that really help enhance the situation for children. And put people together. Oh, you're doing that? You need to work with them. So we empower. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We're there sort of overall sort of putting people together and coming up with ideas and, 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 and innovative ways of making change. Uh, it's so tremendous what you guys do. I'm such an admirer of your work. The website, again, is ourhopeland.org. Deborah Lee Furness, actor, director, human rights advocate for vulnerable children and founder of Hopeland and Adopt Change. Nick Evans, CEO and co-founder of Hopeland. Thank you for what you do and what a pleasure to talk with you. Brian, thank you for your support. Thank you, Brian. Take care. Thanks for joining us for WLIW-FM In Conversation, our special program that brings you dynamic voices from across our region and beyond, and for supporting WLIW-FM, heard over the air at 88.3, streaming on your favorite apps, and online at WLIW.org slash radio.